Alrighty, and then tonight's guest, we have Jennifer Elliott. And Jennifer came to Orlando from South Florida to pursue a degree in biology at UCF. Her undergraduate and graduate work fo focused on marine turtle biology, ecology, and habitat conservation. After her master's, she took the position as land management programs with UCF Landscape and Natural Resources. And here she was responsible for over 800 acres of campus natural lands and all of the St. John's River Water Management District mitigation projects. In 2016, she began her work as the assistant director of the UCF Arboretum, and she is currently the director of the UCF Arboretum. And please welcome Jen Elliott. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Uh, John Buzetka is here with me tonight, too. He's really going to do the meat of the presentation because um, although I was around when the UCF prescribed fire program began, John is really now the one that is in that position that I was in before I moved over to the Arboretum. Um, so he's going to give you the nuts and bolts. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit today about how the program got started, and I'm going to try to convince you um, about this idea of urban ecology and how UCF is uniquely situated, I think, to be a leader in urban ecology. And specifically today, we're going to talk about prescribed fire and prescribed burning in the wild and urban interface. So thank you for inviting us. Um, I'm going to move through my slides. I'm going to try to move through pretty quickly because John really has a lot to say. <laughs> um, so the UCF Arboretum, just in case any of you don't know, I'm sure you probably know where UCF is, but the Arboretum was established in 1983. It was established by Dr. Hank Whittier. Many of you in this room, I believe, were students of Dr. Whittier. John's got some cool stories about some of the people in this room who helped to establish some of the very cool plants that we have in the Arboretum now. And he's going to talk more about prescribed fire in that system and how the um, effects of that um, how it got started and how the effects that we're seeing from that program. So this is just briefly, I'm always trying to make pitches so that you all know what we're doing so that if you come to our events, you know sort of the needs that we have. We work out of a trailer. Um, Hank Whittier was in that trailer and we are still in it. We love it dearly. Um, we're working to maybe get a new um, facility. We also have an outdoor nature pavilion. Uh, and we have a fairly new um, greenhouse that allows us to uh, propagate plants and expand the work that we do. So I just want to talk, um, I am now the director of the Arboretum and Sustainability Initiatives. That's a new combination. It's got a lot of power. I don't want to spend too much time talking about that now. Maybe another time we can talk about that. But I really see urban ecology at the nexus of these three circles that you see up there. So natural resources really falls on both sides, the academics and facilities. That's really our land management program that we're going to talk a lot about today. And our urban forestry on campus, so the programs that John oversees. And then the Arboretum really acts as that academic side, the uh, education and outreach place. That's how we engage the students in the work that we're doing. And we teach about urban ecology. We do all of our outreach through that, um, our internships and all that. And now we've been joined with sustainability initiatives, which really falls more on the facility side. Um, and that allows us to start to work more closely with our landscape crews on things like integrated pest management. And it really falls into this area of urban ecology in that we all, most of us, understand in this room that what we're doing in our urban environments has an impact on our natural lands and an important impact right and this education that we're trying to get to everybody is um, critical in this time so I'm going to try to convince you today about we're going to talk about urban ecology and I'm going to try to convince you um, about how I believe that UCF really can fill this niche because we're this giant metropolitan university and our campus is still abutted against 800 acres of very well managed natural lands thank you very much John um, and his team of, of employees and students and um, I think you know we all know UF is the agricultural school and we're not going to compete with that we shouldn't right we get a lot of our resources from them but UCF is in a, a unique place to be able to uh, advance this idea of urban ecology and so I'm going to try to convince you today about how we're doing that and why that's important so I'm going to go through all these welcome to the Anthropocene right <laughs> you all know everything I'm sure everybody in this um, room knows what that is 
Uh, so I won't define it for you. It is really this idea of a geological time period where humans are responsible for the impacts on the environment and climate more so than anything else. Uh, and so I want to talk to you today about how this idea of urban ecology, I think, can help us find some remedies to some of the issues on this page um, that deal with the Anthropocene. So the first thing I really want to talk about is urbanization in Central Florida. And so I think um, we all know that I think we all know that climate change is real, and as the oceans begin to rise, we're going to continue to see this pressure on the interior of the state. With our coastal communities going underwater, people are going to start to move into the middle of the state, and uh, we have these beautiful areas of natural lands in the state, and so the urbanization is probably not going to stop, and so I'm going to try to argue that we really need to learn how to live in this wild and urban interface. Um, and not just live in it, but live in it well. Live in it, you know, so that we are not destroying it, so that we can um, really enjoy it and reap the benefits. Not that, as Ian said, not that I think that we should see it as a commodity, but um, it is important for us to learn how to live. Oh, and so this is the urbanization in Florida today, and not to be a big bummer, but that's the trend. And so you can see that a lot of the red in that picture is focused in Central Florida. And this is just another reason that um, I think that not only am I going to try to convince you today that we can do this, that we can live in this wild and urban interface, but that we must. Um, I don't have any good ideas on how to stop this from happening, and so my best suggestion is that we're going to have to learn how to manage these natural lands within this, these urban systems. And I think a place like Mead Gardens really, because it's a botanical garden and it's a place of um, of learning and education, I think that places like this really can um, do a good job uh, of serving this role, especially because it is in this incredibly urbanized area, much like the eight-acre Arboretum Park where, um, where our office sits. It serves as that transitional piece between our largely built environment and then our natural lands. So I also want to talk a little bit about um, biodiversity loss. So, uh, Florida was recently listed as a biodiversity hotspot, and I just want to reiterate that in order to be a biodiversity hotspot, you have to have two things. Not just a unique amount of biodiversity that's not found other places in the world, but also the impact of urbanization, that pressure from urbanization. So Florida has both of the, the Southeast US has both of those things. So um, we have unique and rare habitats, and we also have tremendous pressure uh, from urbanization. So, again, I'm going to try to argue to you that UCF, I think, is an excellent case study for this idea of urban ecology. UCF in 1967, that's UCF in 2016. I think you get the picture. I need to update it, but um, it hasn't grown too much since then. Certainly not outside of that inner core, but this is a great example locally of, of what I'm talking about. So one of the best tools that we have in our toolbox for urban ecology and for managing lands in the wild and urban interface is prescribed by, or just managing lands in general. Um, Florida, all of our ecosystems in the state of Florida are not just fire adapted, these ecosystems are fire dependent. And the reason that they're fire dependent is because of this map. You can see um, Florida is the lightning capital of the United States. Uh, and if you can, I don't know if you can see it, but in the central Florida region where we are, it's even purple, right? So even more red than red is purple. And um, so many of our ecosystems are driven by that kind of disturbance. Uh, and so when we have urbanization and we suppress fire, we lose the biodiversity that these ecosystems have. This is just another example of that. In orange are all of the fire-dependent um, ecosystems in the state, and so you can see essentially the entire state has these. What happened? <laughs> and then we're at UCF, right? And I love this picture. I don't know if you can see the lightning strike back there, but that is a lightning strike right over our stadium. And so um, we understood, I was an undergraduate student there in 2004, and, I was in the ecology classes and uh, we were learning about land management and biodiversity and all of these important things and then we would go out into the arboretum and the lands were overgrown, right? So we were having all these, trying to have all these conversations about what were we going to do. For us as students, it was really about increasing biodiversity and trying to implement those things that we were learning in ecology. Um, 
but the university wasn't super interested in hearing that. So then we would try to say to them, well, you know, this is a dangerous situation. We've got these fire dependent communities, and if we have this overgrown um, area, then you know we're going to have a problem. And they didn't want to hear it. And then guess what happened? Um, on April 20th, 2004, we had a wildfire on campus. Uh, it was in our Cypress Dome. And it was at that point that I think the university really it came back and we're like, oh, okay, what is this fire thing that you guys are talking about? Um, I do want to say that I think it's important to note that prescribed that these ecosystems are not dangerous if they are well managed. The problem with UCF was that we had um, a tremendous, we had 800 acres of unmanaged land. And we had been talking about that for a while. So I really do want to reiterate, and I think that John will be able to drive that home a little bit more, that these ecosystems are super important for the state of Florida. They're important for all of us. They're important for the future of the state. Um, and they are wonderful, wonderful habitats with great biodiversity and completely safe as long as we are able and willing to manage them properly, which is what we are doing at UCF. And we want others to understand like I said, that not only is it possible, but it's necessary. So 2004, 2005, after that wildfire, that was when the, um, our program officially started. I gave this talk once before, and Jack Stout came to me afterwards, and he said to me, well, we did do a prescribed fire in the Northwest Parcel in the you know, mid to late 90s. So it's, you know, it wasn't, we didn't start the prescribed fire program. Uh, at UCF in 2004, but that was when we really actively started managing the land. <clears throat> so again, I want to, before I turn it over to John, I just want to drive home these two important things I want you to keep in your mind. There are, there are two mutually beneficial reasons that we do prescribed fire. The first one, and the one that we were able to sell the university on, is fuel load reduction, therefore wildfire mitigation. We do those burns in the winter time because that's, and John can talk a little bit more about why, but that's really about reducing fuel loads and protecting our neighbors. And that was something that hadn't been done for a long time. We got to the point, we are now at the point, because after 15 years of active and well done management and burning, we are now able to do summer burns. Summer burns are when that lightning would usually happen, and that drives these bio, um, biological and biodiversity responses that we're not seeing. So I want you to understand that it's a long process. I also want you to understand that natural lands are not dangerous. Um, they are wonderful and beneficial in all sorts of ways, uh, but we do have to manage them. And again, I want to drive home the idea that we can and we must manage these areas in these urban settings. I promise you it can be done. And John is now going to talk to you about how we do it at UCF, some of our successes and challenges, um, and yeah, the future of our program. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. Appreciate it. Wow, the voice sounds so weird on the microphone. I know, I like it. Yeah, it takes a second to get used to. Uh, thank you, Jen. I have a lot more to thank Jen for than just introducing me. Uh, quick little story time when I was a uh, fresh little uh, undergraduate, graduate. I was looking for a job, and a job opened up at the Arboretum. I went and interviewed. I was super psyched about it. Thought I got the job. I interviewed fantastic. Knew everything I needed to. And uh, Jen called me the next day and told me that I did not have the job. <laughs> she was the first one. And then the day after that, she called me back and said, we're creating a position for you. So go on over. So the rest is history, as I say. So why do we start fires on purpose? A lot of you might be in the know on this. I'm actually pretty sure most of you do because you are plant-minded people. But just to kind of reiterate, Florida is a naturally kind of low nutrient state. So a lot of the fires when they come through, they burn up the detritus and a lot of the plant material that's on top of the forest floor turn it into a much more easily absorbable nutrient source for a lot of the trees, this sort of vegetation, and herbaceous little vegetation. Um, there is a very unique relationship between the canopy, the midstory, and the herbaceous levels that is managed by fire. If any one of those actually predominantly the mid-story level vegetation gets too out of control, grows too thick, gets too high, what happens? Shades out the herbaceous level sunlight, right? So then you start to see diminished return on herbaceous level vegetation, and then it starts to change ecosystem. Uh, a lot of times pine flatwoods, if left uncontrolled, oak encroachment comes in, and 
and get an okay back after many, many, many years pass. Um, so keeping frequent fires in the ecosystem at the interval that's required keeps that ecosystem intact. Uh, also seed production. A lot of plants in Florida and in the southeastern United States are very well adapted to the fire, so much so that their reproductive success and growth stages are dependent on that frequent fire. A couple examples I could think of are the sand pine. So the sand pine, a lot of times, has what's called a pyrophytic cone. That cone sometimes won't open up until it has a heat index of, I think, over 110 degrees, and that seed, that cone, will open up and disperse. And the sand pine actually wants to catch on fire, so it combustible. So it actually combusts, seeds spread, they germinate, and they grow because of fire. Uh, invasive species, this isn't true for all invasive species. There are some that actually do like fire. Um, but for the uh, most days, a lot of our invasives, especially from like Southeastern Asia, like air potato, deer pot tree, uh, invasives like that, they get beat down by fire and they won't come back. So it's a really good tool to kind of keep invasives encroaching into our forests. Uh, and then, of course, do you think the UCF administration, our president, really cares about biodiversity and seed production with fire? <laughs> no, they, they really could care less than the truth. Uh, but wildfires are our argument. They understand now that if we set regular, healthy, prescribed fires, wildfires, if they do occur, are much, much smaller, easier to control, and sometimes don't even occur at all. So that is pretty much our ticket to burn. All right. So we see it as a responsibility of ours, being in such close proximity to a lot of other natural areas. There's a lot of wilderness management areas and state parks and even private areas to the east of our campus. I don't know if you can see it, but you see up this outline in that yellow perimeter right there. Um, so we actually have the little Ekanawakahatchee that flows and then eventually, you know, it gets smaller by the time it gets to campus, but we have direct connectivity through our hydrology to the Little Econ and the Big Econ, then eventually the St. John's River, and that flows out to the ocean. So what we do on campus, what we put in our water, it affects all the areas around our campus and the connectivity to a lot of other natural areas. Um, so we see those as our responsibility as well to make sure that we manage this as well as we can. And by the way, if anyone has any questions while I'm talking, I kind of like to uh, answer questions while I'm going. So let's throw a hand up. So this is campus. We have had a few wildfires um, since 2004. I'm sure plenty before that as well. Um, but here you can see aligned in the yellow polygons. Uh, those are some of our larger fires down in the east. Uh, we've had a couple small ones up there on that 2015 fire. I actually responded to that. It was, uh, it was fun. Um, but because of our really good and well-established fire break system that I'll kind of cover in a few slides, these fires did not get out of control. I wasn't there for that 2009 one. That one kind of looked like it might have gotten out of control, to be honest. The other ones were stopped by our fire breaks and occurred in units that did not have an incredible amount of fuel, which is another term for vegetation. You'll hear me use the term fuel and just pretty much it's vegetation in the context of fire. Yes? I'm curious, do we know or do you know anything about animal, animal behavior when there are fires? We're talking about how plants are adapted to I'm just very curious about certain animal like horses or armadillos. What do they do when things start getting hot? <laughs> Fantastic question. I was planning on getting to that later in the slides, but I'll answer it shortly for you now. They get the heck out of Dodge, short story. Um, I've seen deers jump over 10 foot tall flame lines before. Gopher tortoises, of course, go into their burrows. Um, I'll kind of explain their ecology in a little bit. They kind of are the savior of the flatwood system, especially for the uh, smaller invertebrates, the snakes, and a lot of the uh, herpetofauna that you'll see in the forest. They go down into the burrows that the gopher tortoises create there. They're known as a keystone species, and they are a keystone species, a very important part of the ecosystem because they provide habitat and safe uh, refuge for a lot of the animals, mostly insects, to be honest with you, to go down into the burrows and escape the fire. Uh, but a lot of the mammals, they just get out of there as fast as they can. That being said, there are casualties. I'm not gonna lie. There, there will be, but I honestly don't see a lot. And we do, uh, every post-fire, we usually do a survey through. I Usually, it's not even noticeable dead animals, so. Yeah, good question. And I'll elaborate on that in a little bit. 
All right, so UCF is very unique, actually, for a university. I mean, we have 850 acres total of natural areas. That includes this little patch over here that we call the McKay Tract, all the way to the west. Um, that is a uh, very difficult unit to manage. Uh, it's completely surrounded by urbanization. It is a, uh, it is a very overgrown uh, bay ball system, very wet. Walking through there is pretty hellacious to tell you the truth. So we do a lot of invasive exotic management in there. We have yet to have a successful prescribed fire in there. Um, that's not to say that we have unsuccessful prescribed fires. We've never been tried. But this map shows all the, the assemblage of all the different community types that we have on campus. Predominantly wetlands. Our most uh, predominant uh, ecosystem on campus is music flatwoods, uh, followed by pine flatwoods, bagel, wet flatwoods, and uh, a lot of these systems transition into another one through ecotones. An ecotone is basically a shared area between two ecosystems where the transition shares the composition of both ecosystems. So usually the most biodiverse areas are in that transitionary zone. So, and we do have some sand hill up on the front, uh, historically sand hill. I would say we're, uh, we're just getting started on a lot of the restoration that we're doing up there. Uh, we eventually want to do some micro burning, uh, but that is a very difficult area for us to burn. That being said, this whole campus is a very difficult area to burn. So I'm going to kind of get into the details of why burning in the wild and urban interfaces is so complicated sometimes. But this gives you an idea of how robust our ecosystem assemblage is. So for Sky Fire Program at UCF, uh, so you can see this is our Unit 10. I'll uh, show you a map in a little bit so you can kind of gauge exactly where you are. You can see our arena in the back. That's where we play all of our football games. And we just we burn right up next to it a lot of times. Um, no, you're fine. <laughs> um, and uh, up there is our crew just starting a fire. I believe that was a test fire up on our Lake Clare unit. Uh, but, you know, obviously some pretty cool pictures. Uh, we started in 2005. Jen kind of outlined what the uh, beginning of our program kind of grew from. It was a fear of wildfires. Um, so that was in 2005. We have, as of now, eight fire crew members on staff. Uh, they're certified and trained. Uh, UCF National Resource Team assisted burning 1,683 acres with our MOU partners in other state parks across Florida. So we don't just burn at UCF because if we only burn at UCF, we wouldn't have nearly enough experience that we need. Um, because on a good year, we might burn eight to ten times, and that's on a good year. Uh, so to get that experience, we usually go elsewhere and help others with our MOU uh, memory and of understanding. Um, relationship with other state parks. And I'll kind of touch on that later as well. And uh, wildfires have burned 35 and a half acres on campus since 2004. So here's, yes? Some of those wildfires are arson? <laughs> 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 the big one in the parcel, we're pretty sure that was not necessarily arson. It was probably we had a we had a, we had a homeless. Do you ever have had a homeless population? It's always something we're watching out for. But there were homeless people mm -hmm. living down there, and so it's likely that that wildfire, the big one in the East Parcel, was started from a, a fire. You know, mm -hmm. probably not on purpose, but <clears> that's <throat> that's a fire out there. Yeah. So it's really hard to tell for sure unless we have some uh, fire detectives come out and really check. A lot of times we check for that lightning strike, which is you know the Harry Potter star going around the pine all the way down. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm guessing most of those are natural. But uh, you know we do get a lot of weird shenanigans out in the forest, so I would not be surprised. Um, but uh, yeah. So here's some cool images kind of showing what it's like burning in such a urban interface. So it's called Wild and Urban Interface. All the cool kids say wooey. Uh, w U I, um, and uh, so when you're burning in the Wui, there's a lot of factors that you have to take into account aside from just weather. Usually, when you're burning in a state park, federal lands, wherever it might be, you're burning 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 acres. Uh, you just throw it on a match. You don't need that many resources. You don't need that many people because you're so isolated. Here, I think our largest burn so far to date was just shy of 18 acres. Uh, and that was a win for us. Um, so doing a lot of burning in a wild and urban interface is really difficult, 
especially when you have backlog zones. So can anyone take a guess on what a backlog zone might be? Yeah, needs to burn, essentially. Uh, it's basically a zone that hasn't been burned in a very, very long time. A lot of fuel, vegetation builds up, the detritus builds up, and you have really, really high vegetation, usually saw palm, uh, and then a whole bunch of other plants that are just growing and intermingled. The more fuel you have, the more combustion you have, the more intense the fire. So we had a lot of backlog zones when we first started. So what do we do? We gotta burn slow, you gotta plan with a lot of foresight, and you gotta have people on staff that really know what they're doing. So here is an image from our first fire. Uh, can you imagine walking to class and seeing that? That's, uh, that's right behind our library on campus. Uh, and it looks like a structure fire, right? But that's actually our first prescribed fire on campus. And that was actually in Unit 10, uh, which I'm not sure if you all can see. We're not supposed to walk away from this computer, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I usually do an interpretive dance with this presentation, so I can't do that. Uh, yeah, so that's Unit 10, and we call that actually a fire route. That's the unit that we burn the most. It's in rotation. It's usually a very cut and paste, very easy kind of burn. Uh, but this is all of our management units that we split up. And all of those yellow lines are essentially fire breaks, or aka trails. Um, you can traverse any of those trails. We usually keep our fire breaks at 10 to 20 feet, depending on what ecosystem type is. Obviously, if it's a much higher uh, assemblage of plants, our fireworks are usually a little wider. Um, but a lot of our pine flatwoods that's in rotation, you know, we kind of let our firebreaks close in a little bit. Um, so that gives you an image of all of our units. So how our program was created, this is a little bit of a reiteration, but uh, established sites we wanted to burn, and we wanted to burn them all. Uh, established a burn committee comprised of professors, ecologists, Department of Forestry, and Natural Resource Management staff. We were lucky enough that when we started this program, <clears throat> we had a collection of very notable professors working in the UCF Biology Department. Uh, as you might have heard of Reed Doss, Ross Hinkle, uh, Walter Taylor, uh, Jack Stout. These were all just wonderful Florida ecologists that I consider myself and Jen very lucky to have been able to uh, talk with and uh, get some consult from. Uh, they were a fantastic guiding force uh, between, between this and kind of kept us on a uh, nice and narrow path. Uh, so we created a prescription template for campus, contracted with the Nature Conservancy for our first burn. Uh, Zach Bruzak is actually the one that helped us on our first burn. Love him. Uh, burn, learn, and redevelop the program. You, know, you learn every single burn you do, doesn't matter how long you've been doing it. Uh, train UCF staff to conduct and lead future burns. I will go over our training programs later in the presentation. Thorough. That's all I have to say. Uh, train, I said that. Develop policies, training, equipment. We have a lot of equipment on staff, which we're very lucky to have. Um, a lot of even state parks don't have some of the resources we have. So turning from a landscaping department into a forestry management department. Kind of easy given all of our equipment that we already had, so it was it was nice. It wasn't a huge um, investment to begin. Um, and uh, continue evaluating and adjusting program, and now formally engaging and developing students. That L by L stands for uh, leadership and learning. Uh, it's a program that Jenna started over at the R. I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but we do train students uh, to go through their fire training S130 190, and we uh, we actually held a prescribed fire training at UCF uh, last two springs ago, actually. Yeah. Right before COVID. Yeah. It was, it was actually when it was started. Yeah. yeah. March of 2019. And uh, so steps to burn at UCF are a little bit more uh, detailed than just burning anywhere regularly, like a state park. Uh, you can direct a prescribed fire uh, plan that outlines the burn unit, management goals, smoke sensitive areas, weather parameters, and other parameters to conduct a safe and effective burn. Uh, PR, PR, PR. It is very <laughs> important to communicate with your neighbors uh, when you're burning in an urban interface. Now, how did we do that? I say next door right there because has anyone ever heard of the next door app? That has been a wonderful tool for us. Um, we post on there what our plans are. We usually review it a couple times, make sure the narrative is very well said. Um, and when we first started putting it out, as you can imagine, there was probably a lot of concern from a lot of the neighboring communities 
Um, but we, along with doing that, we actually went door to door to door to all the communities that surrounded our forest and handed out pamphlets. We went out there with our fire engine and we explained to them what we're doing, all the steps that we're doing, and we basically made them feel a lot safer about lighting fire in essentially the backyard. So I can't emphasize enough how important it is that you communicate with your neighbors if you're burning in a wild and urban interface. Because you share the space. It's not like just a forest or a state park where no one will even know you're burning. Hello? 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 Yeah, I guess it's good. Cool. Um, where was I? Uh, and identify any listed species or hydrological issues that would affect the proper installation of firebreaks. When we initially installed all of those firebreaks or our trails through our forest, made sure that it wasn't in the footprint of any sensitive ecosystems that were containing sensitive plants. Um, so, uh, install firebreaks, kind of said that. Monitor the weather to determine the proper day to burn. Now, I will add on to that, monitor the weather and campus events. <laughs> because we have uh, one of the largest universities in the nation. I think we're tied with Arizona all the time. Um, but as you can imagine, we are a small city. There's always stuff going on on campus. So weather is just the first parameter that we really have to check before we burn. Everything else is, is it graduation day? Is the president going to eat lunch at the student union that day? You know, there's a lot of really ridiculous things that we have had to call off fires for. Um, just because they don't want that look, they don't want that smell, they don't want ash, even though we assure them it's going the opposite way. They still don't want it. It's a distraction. And obviously it causes sometimes a lot of traffic on campus as well. you got rubbernecks that turn their heads and see the fire, get an accident. So there's a lot of planning that goes into this. So here's another map of our units. Uh, this is kind of reiterating what I just said. Um, smoke management is huge. Um, which direction do we even send this smoke in this area? You know, if we're burning unit 10 right there, what kind of, what would direction would be best? Obviously, probably west, because it's pushing out that way. Now, if our dispersion, which is the measurement of the amount of lift that smoke has, if that dispersion isn't high enough and it hits that community, then we're smoking out the community. So it's always one or the other, and uh, the weather parameter is most important, but obviously sometimes it's the best on campus as well. Uh, Neighborhoods, you see a function of events, and uh, agency help. So uh, we are in a memorandum of understanding, which is basically a contractual agreement between us and the North and Central Florida Prescribed Burn Working Group uh, so that they come help us with resources and staff, and in return, we send people to go help with resources and staff. It's a beautiful relationship. A lot of state parks do it, feds do it, uh, and we were lucky enough to be invited into that agreement. And, uh, a lot of these burners are very excited to come burn on campus because sometimes they've been burning for 10, 15 years and they've never burned in such an urban area like this that they're like amazed. Sometimes a 10 acre burn here is much more exciting than a 500 acre burn at a state park. So, <laughs> this is one of our uh, really cool success stories and uh, it started pretty rocky. Um, there's a map later on in the presentation that I'll show you so you get the exact location, but we had the perfect weather parameters to burn our Unit 10, which is our most frequently burned unit, so it was very predictable. The fire was not going to be intense, we knew exactly where the, where the smoke was going to go, but the athletics director caught wind that we were going to be burning. Um, they tried to put a stop to it. Our director at the time kind of pushed back a little bit. They had a educated conversation on how to go forth with the day. Well, he had enough confidence in us, and he instilled that confidence in the athletics director, and we were able to go ahead and burn. And our unit was maybe 50 feet away from this field, and this was their championship game that they ended up winning while we had a prescribed fire very, very close by. So it was like a cool win, kind of showed our stuff a little bit, like, hey, we really know what we're doing. Burning in our forest is kind of like, you know, sweeping the floor sometimes. So another step that we took a few years ago, since we're so close to not just the UCF community, but adjacent communities, are we applied for a grant program through uh, Florida Forestry that helps us put in fire breaks. Now, we have, see these red lines right here? Those really communities bump up against our forest, and those are incredibly backlogged zones. Some of them are wetlands, but there's pretty much overgrown salt palm, pine, 
uh, Inkberry, Wax Merle, pretty, pretty standard edge community stuff. And uh, so we came in and we, that's the after photo right there. And we just had a mulching head go through and mulch about 100 foot wide fire breaks that push up against those uh, communities. And uh, that was received very well from the uh, neighboring communities. They saw it as us being responsible neighbors to them. Uh, so that definitely helped our relationship as well. Here's some more before and after photos. Now a lot of the, yes? Um, how big is the mulch that you are putting down? Oh, it's, it's like, so we're not putting down mulch. That's actually mulch the vegetation from that area. So we use a mulching head in front of a skid steer, and that basically just creates the mulch um, from the saw palm and the woody vegetation that's in the way. Um, so we didn't lay any down any mulch at all. That's just the uh, vegetation that was standing there. Yeah. So a major concern from our neighbors after we did this is, where did all the animals go after you did this? I feel like I don't even have to answer that. So here is a wildfire, or not wildfire, a, a management unit map with all of our fire history on it. I mean, you can't read it, but this is one of the uh, maps that we use to report uh, in-house and to communicate with a lot of stakeholders that are interested in our program. Uh, the red indicates wildfires, green are prescribed fires, and black are where and the dates that we mulch those units. So we keep a very close tab on all of our management units. So day of fire, what happens? We put a lot, a lot of planning into it. This is a pretty standard ignition map. This is the direction at which we burn. So there are a couple of different types of fires. All are hot. Um, so we have flanking fires, backing fires, and head fires. Does anyone know what a head fire is? No? So it is a fire that moves with the wind direction. So here, the wind is coming from the southwest. Right, so it's coming from where I'm standing up towards that letter C, right? So if I was going to let a head fire on this unit, I would light the fire down at G. Now that seems like the thing to do, right? You want to light with the wind, it pushes the fire, right? Well, the downside of the head fire is it burns very, very hot and burns very, very quick. Um, it's usually pretty uncontrollable. Uh, given the community type, sometimes head fires are good, but for the most part, we do not do head fires. They're very fast, very aggressive, uh, and they move quickly, usually not stimulating the proper stimulus that is needed in the ecosystem. Uh, so we use what's called backing fires mostly and flanking fires. Uh, so we actually start the fire up at unit or at point C and actually burn against the wind. So what happens is we move forward a little bit, we light the forest. And then that wind pushes all the way back, creating a nice black area that's all burnt. Then you move up a little bit more, you light more, and then that pushes into the black. And that is the safest way to burn because you always have burnt material behind your fire just in case it gets out of control. It goes towards a safe area and not towards receptive vegetation. So we usually just use backing fires. And it's much slower, eats away at that detritus a little bit more because that's kind of our goal. You know, in a lot of our forests, we have a detritus layer that is as thick as a mattress, and it's like this, and you can jump on top of it. So our goal with the fire is to kind of peel that detritus away, kind of like an onion with frequent fires, trying to get back down to mineral soil in most cases. So this is just a burn map. Of course, we have a pavilion right in the way, and that's one of those busy intersections on campus that we have. Um, so it's, uh, we're burning right up on campus, and that's a garage C, one of the most popular garages as well. So. so how much do you burn? Not every ecosystem is created the same. Um, you have your one to four inter one to four year intervals, your five to fifteen, your fifty to one hundred, and even your more than one hundred. Right. So what are some of the ecosystems that fall in that one to four range? Pine flatwoods, grasslands, even sandhill falls within that range. Very, very frequent fires in order to keep the ecologically uh, sensitive assemblage intact. You have your five to 15 year fires, upland scrubs, scrubby flatwoods, same as pine flatwoods, just a little bit more folk encroachment, uh, cypress swamps, et cetera. Your 50 to 100, usually sand pine, jack pine, great lakes, uh, lodgepole pine, uh, usually systems not associated with Florida. 
Many have more than 100 year fires that are based swamps, maple systems, basic swamps, etc. So wetlands actually do burn. I've seen forests that are inundated with water carry fire very effectively and they still should burn. So this is the map that kind of went along with the softball story. Uh, there's the softball uh, field right there, and uh, unit 10 is the one that we burned that day. And here's the weather parameters. It was absolutely perfect. It was right in that sweet spot. So what did we learn? We learned that burning backlog zones gets very hot, gets very intense. And if you burn too quickly, you end up killing a lot of things. Uh, in this case, a lot of pines. Um, so sometimes there's really no way to avoid that, though. I mean, you can get in there, you can pull the duff away from the base of the pines, you can spray them down, you can really do that. But when you're talking about hundreds of pines throughout the unit, minimal staff, um, sometimes it's just not a possible feat. Um, so you try to burn as slowly as you can. You try to reduce the residency time of the fire, which is the amount of time the fire sits in one place. Um, you try to keep it moving a little bit, but this was one of our first burns and we lost a lot of pines. And uh, we still lose a lot of pines when we're burning zones that haven't burned in a while. Um, and that's just that's one of the downsides of keeping a unit or a forest unburned for so long is it is just not ready for that fire again. Um, so that is, that is definitely a lesson we took away, but it's even a lesson today that sometimes we can't avoid. So positive results, we burned over 360 acres since 2005. Uh, UCF staff held Florida Park Service burned 330 acres of state line in 2016 alone. Uh, we're successfully managing and increasing wildlife and plant populations in an urban and fragmented environment. We have a very robust flora and fauna assemblage on campus. And I'm going to get that in a little bit, uh, but very impressive. And a lot of it, I feel like, has to do with our fires. Uh, we can turn you to burn with over 1,000 neighbors and 40,000 residents at UCF. I think our population now is like 72,000. Um, there's research opportunities through the biology department since we have such an active burn program now, land management program, forestry, soil, uh, animals, plants. So we, we have a lot of researchers, undergraduate and graduate, that go in post-fire and do a lot of different measurements. It's, uh, it's very, very cool. It's like an outdoor living laboratory. Um, and partnerships make our program happen. Uh, the MOU partners and a lot of the other uh, teachers and educators that we've had, such as Zach Kruzak, really help establish our program and get us headed in the right way. So this is a map of some of our vegetation monitoring units. So after fires um, and twice a year, we go out to each one of these units, uh, usually once in the dormant season and once in the growing season. These are randomly dispersed. Um, so we usually go out there and we measure canopy, mid-story, or invasive level vegetation, of course with qualitative data and uh, any kind of notes that we might need to take. But uh, I have an example of the data sheet coming up here. Um, and we do have some threatened endangered plant species on campus that are super, super cool, um, a lot of which started popping up after fires, uh, such as our uh, Calpogon Floras. Uh, we've seen uh, Sclepius curtsii, um, or some other cool ones, or the Sparabola species uh, that just started growing at UCF. Um, it, we, we actually didn't know what kind of species it was, but we knew it was a Sparabolus. Um, and uh, we had a couple of biologists, ecologists come out and take samples of it. And they actually identified it as a new species of grass. Uh, I think it's Osceolensis. Yeah. Yeah. So um, really cool. And that's a drop seed grass, uh, sparkliness. But, uh, and you know, we have uh, blue butterwort, Britain's bear grass, uh, Curtis's milkweed, as I just said, a lot of Garberia, actually, uh, Calamintha coccinia. Um, a lot of really, really cool plants out there. And some high school bomb. We'll kind of get to that story in a little bit. So here is our data sheet that we use. Uh, we've been using it for years. Um, on the first section is broadleaf grasses and grass-like things, rushes and sedges. Uh, then we have uh, mid-story level vegetation, canopy, uh, and then we have a section for nuisance, exotic, invasive, and everything. So it's a very comprehensive data sheet that we usually use. So here's some of the TNE species that we have. Uh, the textbook bomb, uh, Dysarandra finicola, usually occurs just out in Titusville. Um, so I believe one of our distinguished people, a uh, woman, came and actually planted uh, the Titusville bomb in our scrub area on campus. So I believe, if anyone could correct me, we have the most 
Western occurring types of bomb on campus because of Catholic. Um, can't even take the credit, but <laughs> thank you, thank you nonetheless. Um, and uh, and we've been monitoring that as well, and it's been spreading. We actually have new sprouts coming out from other locations close by. Uh, it's a very very cool plan. Um, and of course, our leafless beet orchid uh, pops up in the same area every single year, more and more every single year. It's just beautiful to see. That's one of my favorites. Um, but there's a list of uh, some of the animals and plants that we see on campus. Uh, here's some images to stimulate your senses. The butterfly orchid, I freaked out when I saw that. I thought that was amazing. Here's a pitcher plant up in our northeast parcel. We have actually a lot of pitcher plants on campus. One that Jackie Raleigh actually planted in our unit 10 in the middle of a depression on marsh. Um, and that one is still alive and kicking today. I just want to add that we have burnt the bejesus out of yeah. Jackie's pitcher plant and I freaked out. Dr. Miller's Catherine, I call it Catherine's bomb, but um, both of those have been burnt to a frisk and are returning um, tenfold. I was going to say that's like 10 times the size of what the plants there. That's not the same one, actually. Yeah, no, that, yeah, that one's up in the northeast part. But yours is pretty close to that side. Okay. <laughs> that was the best view from the airport. Oh, I know. Yes, I remember that. So here's some more. That Calipogon multiflorus, it's a very, very cool ground orchid, and it pops up two weeks after a fire comes by. So it's all black in the background. And, um, and then it flowers for a few days and then it goes away. And uh, the only time you'll really be able to see it is when it's flowering. So we always uh, monitor about two weeks after a fire in those units. <clears throat> okay, so Stegia virginiana, I love that one. Here's some of our um, leafless beet orchid, and that's the Asclepius curtsii that we found in our uh, scrub unit. We do have a little bit of intact scrub on campus, not a lot, uh, but we did have a very nice successful scrub burn uh, there a couple years back. And back to your question about gopher tortoises. So we had a lot of them. Uh, since UCF, I believe at one point in time, was connected to just a vast, beautiful, very intact Florida ecosystem uh, of assemblage. I think we have a lot of remnant occurrences of animals and plants here that find it difficult to move in and out, one of them being the gopher tortoise. Uh, we have such a healthy population on campus that I actually think it might even be unhealthy one of them because they are populating very quickly. Um, and since we're burning a lot more, they are finding much more favorable habitat, good food availability, uh, so they are reproducing at a very healthy rate. Um, as you can see, those are all green burrows, are all active burrows, and the uh, red ones are inactive. Um, and um, so we see them very frequently, and I think uh, territorially speaking, uh, they're pushing each other out a little bit. We do see a lot of them like close to roadways, uh, burrowing along berms that are man-made, um, and uh, so we work closely with gopher tortoise agents to make sure we relocate them, um, not on-site, but in an off-site reception area. Yes. What do you attribute that red area of far east? Why it was like a a lot of dead birds in that one area? Do you have any idea what that's about? I'm not quite sure to tell you the truth. Um, uh, I'd like to guess that, and John, correct me if I'm wrong. I know that's really wet. That trail going from 13D down is really wet. Yes. That's it. That's that could be. When I looked at that map up here, I thought the same thing. I wonder what was going on over there. The only thing that I could think is that it is wet, and maybe they were using that area more before we started burning. Yeah, and now that they've got better habitat, they're able to yeah. to move away from that space. I don't know. That's just a hypothesis. Yeah, and, and even like a north of even seven, like that holds a lot of water, and there's a lot of active birds up there as well. Um, so that, that could be a good hypothesis. I'm not sure actually. We also have black bears on campus. We actually have one on right now, and that's one of the benefits of being tapped in with the next door. I actually saw a, a, a post where someone took a picture of a black bear going into our forest. Um, so I know there's one hanging out there right now. And a couple of years ago, the a mother actually gave birth to a couple of bear cubs on campus as well. So uh, they approve. 
We've got deers, otter, uh, many, many sand hill cranes who are the actual uh, owners of the campus. Uh, <laughs> White-eyed vireos, wood storks, ospreys, and of course, all of the usual venomous suspects. Obviously, only one of the two of these are venomous. Uh, we see a lot of pine snakes, actually, which is uh, pretty rare. Um, they're fossorial snakes that live underground most of the time, but in the past couple of years, we've seen at least four of them, uh, which is pretty amazing. A very high population of rattlesnakes, diamondbacks. I have seen duskies uh, on campus, but not too often. Red rat snakes, red or yellow rat snakes, and the occasional coral. Now, all of this, uh, all these animals and all these plants really lend itself to research. So we have a biology department on campus. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the uh, older uh, biology professors I mentioned earlier, a lot of them are retired, um, but many good biology professors are taking their place, such as Dr. Parkinson. Uh, he's actually not on our campus anymore. He moved to uh, Auburn, I think? Clemson. Clemson. And uh, he used to actually tag our uh, snakes that we used to find on campus, and they would track their uh, movements. Uh, we also have, has anyone ever heard of zombie ants? Yeah, so we have, we have a, uh, uh, the ant lab on campus who studies the zombie ant thing. If you're unfamiliar with that, it's basically a fungus that invades the ant's brain and tells them to go up on a piece of vegetation, allowing that ant to spread more fungal spores on the entire colony. So it's uh, very, very cool. And we actually had a scientist come from Europe just to study them here on campus. And uh, they are on campus. And uh, that's a quad right over there just measuring uh, certain vegetation studies that students were doing. So we also host a lot of uh, research in the Arboretum. This up here are a uh, group of students that uh, I was overseeing for a carbon sequestration study. Uh, how much uh, carbon do the pines inside of some of our units hold? So we can kind of expound from there. These students were doing an urban heat island effect study. Those are uh, urban heat island meters. And we'll have uh, herpifaunal studies as well. That's a uh, drift net to catch different kinds of uh, snakes and uh, even insects and uh, other kinds of reptiles. and. Um, uh, amphibians. So this is probably the most important slide. It's the most boring, but it's the most important. Um, for wildland urban interface burning, enhanced foresight is an absolute must. Over planning is the right amount of planning. Uh, you got to cover all your bases because if something does go wrong, you need to be able to justify why it did. Uh, and something going wrong once is just once too many. I'm uh, not sure what would happen if we had a spot over or a fire that got out of control in the eyes of the administration. So we uh, definitely err on the side of safety and caution on every single one of our burns. We've called off as many burns as we've done. Uh, larger, wider fire breaks, that goes without saying. Uh, burn with the wind for successional fires. Maybe that's a uh, wrong statement. They're responsible to be burning with it. We usually burn against it. Uh, easier to control. Uh, communication, 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 next door app, neighbors need to know everything. It's really good to follow up with the neighbors as well and tell them about educational things, why animals and plants would enjoy it, give them a sense of ownership of the community as well. Um, very good relationship with uh, Florida Forestry Service. Uh, we're lucky enough to have a very good friend who works closely with us and helps us plan a lot of our buyers and prescriptions. So we. Uh, we had a, uh, somebody holding our hand through the establishment of our program, which was very, very nice. Uh, the MOU relationships very touched on and resourced. So that was kind of easy for us, given we were already a landscaping department. We had a lot of UTVs that were water accessible. Uh, we had a lot of tools, rakes, uh, blasties, axes, all that kind of stuff. But the most helpful thing that we just recently got was our own Type 6 wildland firefighting engine that gave us an enormous amount of confidence not necessarily during the fire, but post-fire. Because a lot of times, even days after a fire, the fire will sprout back up uh, from the vegetation. And uh, so that gave us the ability to in-house respond to these fires instead of calling an MOU partner or a contractor. Uh, Long-term goal, we need to create standard operating procedures and put effort into creating a culture that passes the drip torch along to the successional cohort of land managers. Um, so if you didn't know that, Joe, I'm sure torch is the tool you use to put down the fire, right? So I uh, try to make a joke. <laughs> and uh, so foresight, foresight, foresight is the most thing that can go into that. Now, of course, training. Uh, these are some of the trainings that I've gone through personally and a lot of our people that 
really kind of managed day of fire, not necessarily everybody that's helping us, but really the leaders in the program. Uh, S13190 is your basic introductory uh, training into wildland fire, into fire behavior, 211, portable pumps and water use. Turns out it's very important to know how to put water on a fire. Uh, S212, wildland fire chainsaw is very important. 215, operations in the wildland urban interface goes into behavior of fire a little bit more, but with the effect of urbanizations, roadways, different kinds of effects that even burning such as edge effect or wind dropping in. Uh, engine Academy had to use an engine when suffering for a whole week. Um, S290, intermediate wild and fire behavior, uh, annual refresher trainings, doing your pack tests and making sure you basically you show up to the forestry office and they teach you all the latest and greatest in safety uh, and training and tips and kind of give you a projection of what the weather is going to be like for that year. And uh, of course, pack tests and pack tests are basically making sure you're physically capable of handling uh, heavy weight and uh, the intensity of the day of fire. So this is a picture of us after a fire with a lot of our MOU partners. This is a list of all of the different partners that we uh, work with in uh, North and Central Florida. Uh, some of them are Alachua Conservation Trust, uh, Brevard County, uh, Camp Blending, uh, City of Gainesville, Flagler County, uh, the Nature Conservancy, St. John's River Water Management District, uh, they have all came to burn with us, and we've gone to go burn with them. So we learned an immense amount from working with a lot of these partners. And they love coming to burn here because it's just so interesting. They usually don't burn somewhere that is just so populated and uh, has buildings and a football game going right next to them. So this is our Type 6 fire engine that I just want to brag about for a second. Beauty. Um, and uh, this has enabled us to burn a little bit more aggressively because usually the day of the fire will end a little bit early so that we can be very thorough with mop up. And mop up is essentially cleaning up after fire, making sure everything's patted out. But even though there's no flames, it doesn't mean that there's still not fire living underneath the ground in the detritus that might eventually flare back up a few days later. Having this engine on site allows us to respond very quickly and snuff that fire out before it gets too intense. Any questions?